the rope, sweating, trembling. You know, you're hanging on so tight, and you know you're going to fall, and you're just sweating. And I, that Theodore Roosevelt quote about when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. No, the Lord says let go. His hands were two inches below this person's feet. And all they had to do was just let go and rest. And they were straining and worried and they, images of death and destruction. And they just had to let go and rest in the Father's hands. And then the other thing, you know, we pray for revival. And the new thing that God's going to do. And God said so clearly, I can't, I, I'm not interested in revival. I'm not interested in what was almost dead. I want what is dead. I want resurrection. The new thing is resurrection life. It's not revival. It's not a meeting. It is a life filled and led by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Our shadows heal. We walk by graveyards and people just rise from the dead. I mean, that is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that lives in our hearts. That is who we are. It is simply the life that we are intended to live in this last day. He's not looking for revival. All of the past revivals, there was the, nobody was willing to die. There was too much of man's stink left in all of those, and it was man that killed those moments of revelation, of resurrection, because man said, oh, we're having revival. That's not what God was wanting to do. This is who we are and how we live. And only that which is dead can be resurrected. But the good news is once it's resurrected, it can never die again. You can revive something, bring it back, revive something, bring it back. Once it is resurrected, it can never die again. So that's what I encourage everybody. When you pray, pray for resurrection. Pray for resurrection power, the grace of God to be so loose in us that we can imagine the impossible. I saw something, um, it said faith, faith doesn't make it easy, faith makes it possible. So just remember, all things are possible in Jesus Christ, all things in Jesus' name. Anybody have any prayer requests or any testimonies this morning? Yeah, Sheila. any prayer requests? All right, well, let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this day, Lord. We raise up this little boy, Isaac, Lord. It's no accident, Lord, that his name, his situation was spoken and brought before this body, Lord. Lord, that you touch that little boy, Lord. For your glory, raise him up in life. Lord, as we just spoke, that resurrection power, Lord. Healing is nothing for resurrection power. Lord, you bring him back and let him live a long and prosperous life for your glory. A living testimony of the power of your grace, Lord. That you encourage that family, Lord. Oh, Lord, let them believe the impossible. Let them call out to you and trust in you, Lord. Jesus, that you have your hand upon every member of this body, Lord. That you encourage us, Lord, you lift us up as we rest in you, Lord. That we let go of the things that we cannot control. We let go of the struggle that is this human life. And we rest in you knowing that you have it all mapped out, Lord. That you have gone before us and you have made the way, Lord, where there isn't one. Oh, Jesus, that you go before us and you light up the way, Lord, that your, your spirit, your word of truth leads us 
us and guides us in all things, little or small. Lord, that you move the mountains and you lay them flat before us. That you bring water into the dry places of our lives. That you bring life everywhere you go, Lord. Jesus, we count it all joy, Lord. Oh, Lord, help to pluck out that unbelief that still tries to steal our joy. That tries to steal our rest. to lift you up, to come together to worship you and praise you. Oh, that we say you are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we come to seek your face. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, what you would have for us this day. Encourage your people, Lord. Rest for the weary, Lord. Joy for those who mourn, Lord. Peace that passes all understanding are ours for the taking, Lord, if we simply just receive them. Lay down our burdens and put our trust and our hope in you. Lord, I believe that you are faithful. I believe you are good. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that is truly new every single day, every moment when we call upon your name, Lord, that you never leave us and you never forsake us. In the good times and the bad, Lord, we trust in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, this morning after the service, um, we're going to have a, a Sunday school meeting. This will be kind of our last attempt. Um, we're also not just going to talk about teachers and helpers, but we are going to talk about our plans for the holiday season, uh, what we're going to do with the kids if we're doing a Christmas pageant or a, a play or just maybe a Christmas party for the kids downstairs. So we are going to have a brief meeting right after service. Uh, and Tom Stamen will be here uh, October 24th. It's a Friday night, so invite somebody, especially the youth. And let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Yes, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Lord. Don and John, you two want to come take the offering this morning? Don, you want to ask the blessing to make?
Hallelujah. Some got thrown in the atmosphere while they're t- taking the offering. We're together again, just praising the Lord. We're together again. Pastor speaks some of this stuff out in s- previous services and stuff. It just kind of lingers in the atmosphere. <laughs> Something good is going to happen. Yes. Amen. Something good is in store. It's already in the atmosphere. Yes. So yes. we just have to grab it out. And, you know, just like mm. a crazy horse, you just got to grab the hunk, hunk of mane and, and go for a ride. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's worship the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. We're expecting, Lord. We're expecting, Lord.
never been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you have never been filled with the Holy Ghost, step in right now, step in right now, step into his reign. of you who have had the Holy Spirit in your life in the past and you feel like you're dry, let the Lord reign and fill you once again. Let it rain.
to wait upon the Lord. Shall renew your strength. Those that wait upon the Lord, He will renew your strength with His strength. Not a fleshly strength, but an unseen strength. hear clearly from you, Lord. Just let it out. I know the Lord is speaking through someone this morning, and I'm not hesitating. I'm yielding. I know it's someone out here and it is.
spoken like a modern day Apostle Paul. <laughs> We're going to go down to the next song, Sheila. <clears throat> this was in the atmosphere Wednesday night, and through the obedience of our sister and brother, this song lies right on it. Some of you may remember it. If you don't, that's okay. And all of you is more than enough for every need, every thirst, and every need. You satisfy me with your love, and all I have is you, is more than enough.
than enough, Lord. that are caught in shackles, Lord. The gentleman was in here earlier this morning in need in some ways that he was asking. But we know that there was a deeper need. He knows the word quote some scripture, but there was a need that was deeper that he was in the flesh asking for. But all I saw in him was chains. All I saw in him was chains and my heart was broken because I keep praying that the Lord would open his eyes to set him free. And I know there's those in our lives, brothers or sisters, children or grandchildren, uncles and aunts, cousins that are so far from the Lord and they knew him at one time but things like religion and man's ways got in the way and just got him so bound up like a python just choking them, just choking the life out of them and the chains are locked so tight the Christmas story where Ebenezer Scrooge was in those chains. Many of our brothers and sisters are in that place right now. The hardest part is that they do not know it. They don't know it. Pride has blinded. Tradition has blinded. So we cry out, be loosed. In the name of Jesus, we cry out. Every 
chain, break every chain, break every chain. Psalms 104, Psalms 107, pardon me. Hallelujah. 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 Calling it out. Hallelujah, Lord. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. And he brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds forevermore. For he breaks down the gates of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron. This day, Lord, hear those that are calling out in distress. Our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are at their end. Lord, you know I'm tired of people going through the motion of church. And then when you get back into a corner, they grab onto a life preserver that's waterlogged. Break it, Lord. Break it, Lord. Break it, Lord. That you have destroyed death. You have overcome the grave. Oh, what can challenge your glory? Have no fear. How many times do you tell us to have no fear? For you have overcome the world. Jesus, we call out the names of those who do not know you, whose eyes have not yet been opened. We call out the names of brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, nieces and nephews, neighbors, friends, and co-workers. Lord, that you said, me and my house shall be saved when I call upon your name, when I put my trust in you. My house is everybody around me, Lord. My house is everyone I come in contact with. Your grace covers a multitude of sins. Your grace is complete, and your grace is your people free. Set your people free from the chains that bind them, from the distractions that hold them back from serving and following you with passion. With passion, Lord. You are a passionate and holy God. You are the breaker of chains. You give liberty and freedom to the captives. I thank you, Lord, that you have set your people free. You have set your people free. But we must walk in that freedom. We must choose freedom and liberty. We must choose to be led by the Spirit and not be hindered by this flesh. Hallelujah. This flesh that binds us to this world, that binds us to the circumstances. We choose to be led by the Spirit. Which is life, which is joy, which is peace, which is resurrection power. We choose to live and move and have our being in you. In the fullness of your resurrection power, Lord. That your sacrifice would not be in vain, but that your glory would be.
break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every worship you, Lord. You know our coming in and our going out, Lord. We've laid these things before your feet, Lord. And right now, Lord, we just want to gather with those 24 elders around your throne. Like in Revelation 4, Lord, crying out, you are holy. You are holy. You are holy. No matter what we're facing, Lord, you are still holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. We come to worship you, Lord.
Jesus, we worship you. We magnify the whole day through. Our voices. Five, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? That's the, nat- the human spirit, the flesh. That's what the flesh is. It's not this epidermis, the skin, this flesh, the bone. It's more than that. It's our thoughts. It's the way that we think. It's the way we approach God. And so he says that the scriptures, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth, lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. That's us thinking we can do what only God can do. Because he goes on to say, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. How do you resist the devil? He just told us. You submit to God. You trust in the finished work of the cross. We're always going to have, and this isn't to rebut what uh, Jason said, because I understand and I agree. But it's the way we overcome this flesh is by submitting to what God's already done. Humbling ourselves in the sight of God and we'll do more quote unquote righteous acts out of that than we'll ever do by trying to discipline ourselves that's the knowledge of good and evil that's the lie that the devil has been selling a man ever since there's been a man I talked about it Wednesday night that's how, how is it that we still sin we still listen to the liar. Mm-hmm. That God's withholding something from you. Or God's not giving it all to you. If you just knew more, mm-hmm. you could have everything. And it's knowing him that provides everything. That's right. Amen? Amen? He is holy. Yes. Hallelujah. And because he's holy, mm-hmm. God declares us holy. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Be seated, please, in Jesus' name. Thank you, worship team. Amen. As they're going to their seats and the Sunday school kids are going downstairs, let me remind you again, anybody that can or wants to be involved in any way with the Sunday school department, it doesn't mean you're making a commitment to to teach every Sunday or 
or anything like that, but just take a moment and, and uh, get with Jamie and Suzanne after, af immediately after the service, and they'll let you know how you can help out in any number of ways. And uh, if you feel like, well, I'm not a teacher, that's okay. There's, there's other things you can do and still be a blessing uh, to the kids and uh, also... There you go. That's what Jesus said, you know, when he told his uh, followers, when many of them were confused and confounded and actually offended, he said, uh, unless you eat this flesh and drink my blood. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a uh, synonymous term or parallel term with by beholding him, we are transformed into his image. Not by looking at us and what we're doing, whether it's good or bad, but by focusing on Christ, that we are changed into that image. Amen. His glory. You know, it, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we are changed, the Bible says, from glory to glory as we behold him. So, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I was thinking when, when Mike was uh, speaking from uh, Psalms 107, I guess it was, about uh, delivering them from darkness. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning in some ways. What I really want to talk to you about is the love of God and the grace of God that passes human understanding. But every... Every act of grace is a demonstration of God's nature, his love. And that's what really I, what God wants us to understand about him more than anything else is his love. Someone said this morning, love covers a multitude of sins. But love brought this whole thing into existence. Love is a powerful, powerful thing because it's the very uh, demonstration, if you will. It's the very clear representation. It's the nature. And more than that, it is God himself. God is love. God doesn't have a whole bunch of love. God just is love. There's no limit to his love just as there's no limit to God. So before I get too far along here, I want to thank everybody for your cards uh, to Sally, most especially, and uh, emails, text messages, Facebook posts, uh, telephone calls, all of the things that uh, letting us know that you were praying for her and for us, for the entire family. Uh, just you can't know unless you're in that situation how important that is and how much it means to you. And uh, also, I'd like to thank Suzanne very much for taking care of Wednesday and Sunday service. Appreciate it. You did a great job. We were blessed. We saw it on the internet. And uh, John, thanks for mowing. You did good, brother. Praise the Lord. I appreciate it. Thanks to everybody for all the things that you do and, and for being there for us and for one another. Um, that's what family is all about, church families are no different than regular families. In fact, in some ways, they're stronger and uh, have a greater influence, praise the Lord. But we really do appreciate it, and it, it helped. I can tell you that my uh, daughter-in-law said at the uh, funeral, and I'm not going to go into all of this other than just to say that she said she could not believe the peace that God had given her in that situation. You've got to figure, this is a mother who's lost her child. And uh, I'm not saying they weren't hurting and still hurting, but I'm saying God does things beyond the natural. And uh, 
her and Daryl, uh, her husband Sally's son, both said the same thing. They, they were just overwhelmed by the presence of God and, and the peace that passes all understanding. That's the God that loves us, not the author of death and loss, but the God who comes to give us life and that more abundantly. And uh, we're, we're so grateful to know him. And even, I think even more, we're grateful that they knew him and know him. Uh, I don't know how anybody goes through these kinds of things without God. It's just, just too much for the natural human being to, to deal with. But with God, all things are possible. Praise the Lord. So if you, if you will, turn with me uh, to Exodus. And I'm going to read from three different places in Scripture just to take a kind of establish the, the direction I want to go in. But beginning with Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, this is kind of a rhetorical question, but how many of you have ever been in a place uh, where you want to hear from God, but you just don't seem like you are? You know what I'm saying? You know he's there. It's not a question of doubting God or a question of God's inability to interact with you or anything else, but it just seems like we used to say in Pentecost, heaven's brass. You know, like just, I know you're there, Lord, but I don't get this. I don't understand this. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about the most recent incident uh, in our life. I'm talking about all of us go through these things. I've, I've been there many times over the last 30 years or so, and uh, it's baffling. You know, it's, it's frustrating. And it, and it makes you a little angry sometimes. And, but more, most importantly, it, it makes us confused. It, it, it causes us to not know what to do next, how to move, how to get forward and get beyond whatever the situation or circumstance might be. So that's really the, what I'm talking about here this morning, that our perceptions sometimes are still coming from the natural. And uh, we are spirit beings. We have the capacity to interact with God, and we've heard many people talking about it here today. We know that we do. We know that God speaks to us. We know that God motivates us and moves us in certain ways and, and uh, you know, validates and, and, and uh, uh, kind of gives us the, yeah, that you're in the right spot. This is what you're doing, and this is why you're doing it, and it's all good, and I'm going to bless it and everything else. But I've had, so, I've had many, many promises that have yet to be fulfilled in, in totality. I may have seen some things, you know, and I, I still have the affirmation. I still have the, the sense that it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just that you, sometimes you go, well, look here. Another birthday coming up here in about six months. When? You know, when's it, when, how are you going to do this? When are you going to do it? But God can do it in a, in a split second. And uh, so many times there's things like that happening. And, but I, I just want to show you from the scripture what I think God's been saying to me, not just in the last week, but in the last 30-some years. And uh, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, this is Moses, uh, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Okay, now let's move ahead in Moses' life, and let's go to Exodus chapter 13 and verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Praise the Lord. Now Exodus chapter 20 and verse 21. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. As humans, we depend on linear thinking. I, we've talked about this before. All of you understand that. Whether we break it down and define it all, that's just the way we are. By, in other words, progressively moving from 
from not knowing to knowing, whether it's the way we go through school or business, job experiences, what have you. We're going from darkness to light. It's, it's neat, predictable, you know, rising from ignorance towards knowledge. But look at, let's look at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 <clears throat> verses 3 through 7. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Now, that's important, that second sentence. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Now, Paul's saying simply that at, he, he says in other places, too, that, you know, I, 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 I was the, uh, the least of the apostles, and yet I labored more, but not me, Christ in me. So, if we trust that we're in Christ, let's recognize that it's not what we're doing in the flesh. It's what Christ has already done in that flesh, God in flesh, that identifies us. Praise the Lord. See, from a spiritual perspective, what really happens is our, our limited ideas and beliefs are being taken away to make room for a bigger reality. It's happening to us all the time as we, if we're growing in God, that's what's happening. How many of you know the beliefs you had five years ago are not the same as the ones you have today? Now, some may remain, they're true regardless. But how many of you look at some of those truths that you've believed maybe all of your life, and now in the last five years, ten years, whatever, they changed? So what happens is when, when that takes place, it makes us feel awkward. It makes us uncomfortable. Because we've been comfortable with a certain belief system and way of approaching God and understanding God that whenever that changes, it, it, it kind of rocks your boat. I mean, it makes you go, you, you get a little nervous, you get scared. Oh, my God, you know, what if I, if I give that thought up, if I give that kind of believing way that I've had in the past, what God going to do? If I'm wrong, is he going to get me? You know, is all, all hell going to break loose? And, uh, you know, bad things start happening to me. Amen? Moses is an example of how God works in us experientially. In other words, how he actually interacts with us and the way that we live out our life. And I hope you can see this this morning, that the first time that Moses meets God, there's light. There's a bush that's burning, and it's not consumed. I mean, this is supernatural. And there's this light, and there's the voice of God. And it's so clear. Everything is so certain. Right? God's working here. I mean, even Moses, with all of his questions and all of his doubting and everything, he, could, he, he was compelled by the reality of this experience. It was so real that he goes back to what he assumed was going to be certain death by going back to Egypt to tell a bunch of rebellious people that God sent him. 
So later on, then, he comes to this, this pillar of the cloud and the pillar of fire. Again, it's the same fire. But this time, there's also a cloud. Still God, but not a steady, continuous, bright, burning fire like the first time. Then, even later on, God meets him at Mount Sinai, and the people don't want any part of this. Because when he moves towards it into this thick darkness, they're saying, whoa, this ain't right. We don't see the fire. We don't see the light. All we see is something frightening, something very dark. But the Bible says where God was. In that thick darkness, God was. Amen? No light, not even a clouded gray area. Sometimes we get the divine, word and we know it's God. Other times it's kind of a gray area, and we kind of, well, I believe that was the Lord. I mean, it, 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 it seems to agree with his word, but I didn't get as powerful. But what about when it's just black? Nothing. God's there. Praise the Lord. Just darkness, unknowing. Moses' relationship with God brought him to the place of not knowing. That sounds like a contradiction. It sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like it's totally stupid. Amen. But he brought him to a place of not knowing so he might come to know. Know what? That you can trust God anytime, anywhere, in any situation, under any circumstance as dark as it might be, as unknowing as you may be at that moment, you can trust God. You can trust the love and the grace of God no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter when everybody else kind of backs away and starts going, I don't think that's God. You can walk right into that darkness and know that he's embracing you, that he has the answer, that's knowing God, church. It doesn't take great faith when you get the audible voice. It doesn't take a lot of faith when there's a bush burning and it, it isn't consumed. It, doesn't take, it may take a little more faith, but it doesn't take a lot of faith to be led by the light, by revelation, day and night. But where God gets glory and where you grow in your understanding of God is in the dark is where everybody else doesn't really want to go there. You don't even really want to go there, but you know, I don't have any place else to go. I'm here. I'm in the dark, and i got to find God for this situation and this circumstance. And everybody else is questioning because they're not seeing light. They're not getting the revelation. They're not getting goosebumps. They're not getting anything except this just doesn't look good. And God says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 20. As I'll tell you, in the dark, you're going to trust God, or you're going to flip out. Because the devil's going to tell you, oh, you're, you're, you're strong. You're, you're strong enough to get through this. Just get stiff up her lip, you know. Throw your shoulders back. Just push on through it. You can handle it. He'll try to talk you in to the fact that God's not in this. He's nowhere near. He's not coming around. He, he's backed away. You know, you're just on your own here, and you're going to have to toughen up and, you know, just make it. Praise the Lord. But in Ephesians, he says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Hallelujah. Praise God. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, 
that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So from known to unknown to known. Amen? From light to darkness to light. That's what God's doing. Amen? This is grace, church. If you think you always have to be in light, always have to be certain, always have to have understanding, you're not going to get very far in this thing. You'll curl up in bed, pull the covers over your head, and wait for a light. Wait for a sign. Wait for a name. Wait for an audible. Wait for something. Amen? The irony is, for those of you that have lived for God any length of time, the more we come to know, the more we understand how much we still don't know. I mean, there was a time when I had some revelation. I don't know that it was actually my revelation. I got a revelation from somebody else's revelation. And I thought, I got the answer here. But then life started coming around. And I realized, I don't know a whole lot. I know something. I know enough about this God to know he's way more than I thought I knew. I don't, I'm just beginning to understand. The devil, I said, is a liar. And he always comes around telling us, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You just need more knowledge. You just need, you know, to, to have more understanding about God, and that's how you're going to get it. The more you know about bad behavior and good behavior, the more you're going to understand the nature of God. That is a lie. And it's about time that we started saying to the devil, if you want me to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, why don't you take a big, long, warm drink of... Shut the hell up. Amen? You have a cup of shut the hell up, and, and, uh, and I'll go on eating from Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is, is more interested in our journey and how we trust him along the way. Look, let's look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 11. And he said unto him, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But in the, that to them that are not, or that are without, all these things are done in parables. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So there's many, many other scriptures that re refer to the, the same idea. But see, God is not a puzzle to be solved. God is a mystery to be explored. You're not going to get all the pieces put together in this life. We will know all things when we get there. In the meantime, we're not supposed to be trying to put the puzzle together here. We're supposed to be trying to enjoy the magical mystery tour. Amen. The mystery journey of knowing God and having him reveal himself more and more and more, coming from light to dark. And because I had to trust him, I found out he can be trusted. And I learned more about God. I learned more about his love. I learned more about his grace. That's what God's interested in. Not having the perfect theology, but having confidence in God 
having faith in him. Go ahead, Ron. Yes, that's right. See, the flesh, the, the flesh always insists on definite answers. I want to have perfect knowledge. I want to understand it exactly. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. See, God transcends our natural mind. He said the natural mind is enmity with God. It can't, it can't get it. It doesn't grasp because God is above human understanding. That's why you have to be in the spirit. That's why to have a real revelation of God, you gotta get you gotta be in the dark sometimes. You understand what I'm saying? You gotta know He's there. And that blesses God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Why? Because everything that God wants to do for us is based on our trusting him to do it. Well, most of the time, when you need something the most, it's the hardest to connect with God, you know, to get a real sense that, oh, everything is going to be okay. There's always a time of darkness where you just got to trust. And that's where most of us have thrown our hands up in the air and say, well, it's because I've been a bad boy. You know, I haven't been perfect. I've done something bad. I, I haven't done something good. And now God's withholding his, the same old lie that the enemy always comes with. You just need to know more about this religion that you're involved in and take more active par participation. And, you know, yet we need to do all of those things because that's who and what we are, but not in order to get God to do something. Right. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter uh, 20, uh, 4, Mark 4, uh, verses 26 and 27. Praise the Lord. By the way, I've been waiting to tell the devil to have a nice warm glass to shut the hell up for a long time. And just wanted to <laughs> Praise the Lord. Eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, praise God. Sally knows I've been dying to say it. Praise God. And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up and he doesn't know how. Now I'll tell you, that right there is a picture of my relationship with God. I've said some stuff, I've done some stuff, but I don't know how in the world it worked. I just know I went to bed and I got up and things are better than they were the day before. I just know that somehow something happens when I come into agreement with God's word. I can still be trep trepidatious about it. I can still be kind of uncertain in some ways and I don't know how he works it out. I don't have the perfect theology. I just try to do what I think he said to do and just go on getting up and going to bed and somehow... It grows. It, it turns into what God promised. Yeah. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I want you to notice this growth thing that we're talking about here. Amen? Second Peter 
chapter 3 and verse 18. Through a, coming into an agreement with God by believing in the love of God, a, a growth results. Amen? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They're the, those are, that's the same thing. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. So what do we do? That's always the question. What am I supposed to do, Lord? We grow as he grows us. I can't grow out of my own willpower or desire or want to. I grow as God grows me. How many of you know you, you may have been doing a lot of stuff for Jesus 10 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. But the doing of that stuff didn't cause you to grow. Amen? Because there were also times that you weren't doing that stuff. You were doing other stuff. But he didn't stop growing you. Amen? You, you went from what you thought was light which is where we think everything grows in the light. The truth is there was as much growth, if not more growth, in the dark. God was still growing you, or you wouldn't be here today. Praise the Lord. We continue to grow by growing in his grace, by depending on his love, by trusting that God's grace is sufficient. By believing in the finished work of the cross. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ask yourself, can you, are, are you willing to walk into darkness even when everybody else stays in the distance? Because the truth is, that's kind of the message Paul's preaching. You're just preaching license to sin, Paul. I mean, everybody was freaking out except for those who had embraced the message. Nobody wanted any part of it. It was darkness. It was uncharted territory. Religion was losing its control. And people were uncomfortable with it. And they still are today. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying even those who, who embrace grace still want to slide a little mixture in there because they're afraid we'll do something bad which we've been doing all along anyhow if not in act in thought and, and in our hearts which according to Jesus is just the same as if you do it you may discipline yourselves and not do it but the very fact that you want to do it is the evidence that you're human Paul said I, I didn't know nothing about coveting until I read it then I wanted to covet everything as soon as I saw it in the scripture thou shalt not covet covetousness rose up in me that's because we're humans the answer to that question I just asked of whether or not you're willing to walk into darkness when everybody else is standing in the distance is what really determines how much of the mystery of God is revealed to you? Now, I know that I had a revelation of God years ago. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, tremendous revelation. I've learned more about that God in the last five years than I did in the 25 years preceding that. Even though I had a revelation... There was a whole lot about this God that I had no conception of. Sally and I saw the guy from The Matrix the other day at the gas station. <laughs> Except he was wearing tennis shoes. Had the long black leather coat. She said, what, what's wrong with people? Don't they look in the mirror before they go out? It was about 80 degrees. <laughs> But he had this long leather, black leather coat. 
like Orpheus or Morpheus or Doofius or somebody. Praise the Lord. But it got me to thinking. I'm always making references to the Matrix, you know, how it's just nobody sees it, but, you know. Well, I got to thinking about it, and, you know, that blue pill is like religion. You know, Morpheus tells Neo, you know, he says, you take the blue pill, and the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. But you take the red pill. That's grace. That's this mystery. You take the red pill, and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Huh? Praise the Lord. See, there's all kinds of spiritual movies out there that, that, are, not on, that are not on Christian TV. But the grace rabbit hole is an endless discovery of God's love. It's forever learning more about what really is, about how God really is love. It's not, see, it's, this is not the journey for pat answers, for, you know, religious rules to obey and to follow and to keep. And Amen? Look at Colossians chapter th uh, 3, verses 1 and 2. One pill makes you taller. It's Jefferson Airplane. Before there were Jefferson stars here. Praise God. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. First uh, Timothy chapter five, verses five and six. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now this, is, this, this, is, this speaks to what we've been talking about earlier this, evening, this morning and kind of about religion uh, and as well. See, we possess eternal life. We possess everything that the finished work of the cross provided. We already have it. It's in our spirit when we got born again. It was given. That's our inheritance, the, the scripture says. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've got it all. So we, re, we possess this eternal life, which is more than just a long time. It's everything that, it's God life. It's all of our needs. Every situation, every circumstance. So we already have this, but A large percentage, I'll just say it that way, are dead to the life that they have. They don't understand the grace of God. They're dead even while she lives, Paul said. Born again, the recipient of eternal life, but basically dead to it because they're still operating from their sense knowledge from their own pleasures and that doesn't necessarily mean bad behavior it means depending on yourself getting your satisfaction through what you do and how you do it and how much effort you put into it instead of turning to God listening to the enemy telling you well if you just try a little harder you know if you just knuckle down and you know Come on. Don't be an embarrassment to God. When God is saying, the only way you can be an embarrassment to me is to not trust me, Amen. is to make it look as though I'm some kind of jerk that wouldn't bless you, that wouldn't help you, that wouldn't always be there for you. I think that, that scripture from 1 Timothy could be a metaphor for the church. Religion, finding pleasure outside of the grace of God. Promoting the religion instead of the God 
that they're trying to represent through that religion. Self-satisfaction. The, the work of Christ is finished regardless of how people respond to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, God is always growing. He's always working. Amen? He's always involved. Grace will always pull you away from what's familiar. In fact, it's true of every real revelation. Anybody ever had a revelation that everybody else didn't have? It'll separate you. It'll cause people to not want to praise the Lord. That's what grace does. And you never got any revelation that didn't come by grace no matter what we might have thought. Praise the Lord. We can always experience the increasing manifestation of God, or God's light, amen? Grace will always exceed anything that we can imagine based on that scripture right there. No matter what we think, Grace will take you further. It'll get you beyond even your imaginations, even what you've dreamed up. This tells me that the promises of God, although some of those promises that I've received from God, I thought, I don't, man, this is huge. It's going to take God and every angel up there to make this thing happen. And I don't even really understand how big it is. I'm basing my thoughts of how much effort and energy God's going to have to put into this thing based on how I can interpret it. But the truth is, according to the scripture, it's so big that my mind can't even begin to fathom it. So God gives me what I can understand in a revelation. Then he wants to give me more of him, more of his grace, so that he gets bigger and my imagination gets bigger so that he can satisfy that desire. But mine are so puny in comparison to what God really wants to do. We settle for such little things when God wants to do something huge because we just think it's too much for him. Why? Because I don't know how I would deal with it. I don't know how I would do it. Hey, if he can give it to you, he can see to it that you can do whatever it is you need to do with it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just think, of, again, thinking of this light and dark, just think about the temple. In the temple, you've got the outer court, which is daylight. You've got natural light coming in there, and you can see anything and everything right there. Then you go into the inner court. It's a little bit closer to the presence of God, the literal pr presence of God. And now you only got artificial light. Now you just got candles. So it's not near as bright, not near as lit up, but you're getting closer to God, and it seems you would think, you know, you'd be getting more, you'd be seeing more, but in fact, it's actually getting darker. Then when you come into the very elasterion, which is the mercy seat, which is grace, which is Christ, it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. They had to tie a rope around. The priest had to go there and, and operate simply by faith. He'd go in and sprinkle the mercy seat, but he couldn't see anything. It was the deep darkness. But that's where God was. That was the presence of God. Amen? And a, and a, and a revelation of Jesus, amen, is what was behind that veil. But it was pitch black. The veil was taken away. so that everybody could have access 
But nobody could have ever had access if somebody wasn't willing to go in there in the dark and believe God to make the trip from what looked to be complete revelation into an uncertainty, into a complete not knowing so that they could know everything. So that they could know everything that they thought they knew when they were out there slaughtering animals. When they were in there lighting candles and burning incense and stacking up the showbread. Which was nothing but symbols and types of what was in the darkness. It looked like they had all this revelation. They're doing it. They're doing what God told them to do. And it's all this religious pomp and ceremony, and they're thinking, man, we are really something special. But now the least of them has access to what was in that darkness. Amen? Praise God. Grace was revealed in that darkness. They, they, it, all the things that they were doing was to bring them to a place of understanding. That, that mercy seat, elasterion is what it's called in the Greek. It's the mercy seat. It's Jesus. It's grace. Why? Because it covered the commandments that were under it so that those wouldn't be used against you and I. The sprinkling of blood the precious blood of Jesus has become our elasterium, if you will. Our propitiation, our substitute. He fulfilled what was in that ark so that we could be free from the judgment that it demanded. It was all done in the dark. It was all a mystery. Now, we know some things other people don't know. Why? Like because of grace, not because we were any more worthy, not because we just were willing to go to a dark place to believe. And because of that, what we didn't know, we know. So I promise you, there'll be some other dark places. But if you're not afraid, the light will come from it. God will become more. God will become greater. Your faith will grow. You'll have the ability to trust him anywhere, anytime, in any situation. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because even though it's dark, it's frightening, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right, Exodus chapter 19 Verses 18 and 19, we'll wrap up here. Praise the Lord. Exodus 19, 18 and 19. <clears throat> and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded, along, sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by voice. Uh, chapter 20, verses 18 through 21 now. It's a continuation of this. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before, be before your face, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. All right? Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. This is the last scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 22 through 29. 12, uh, 
22 through 29. There we go. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to, the, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things that of, than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh to us uh, from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Uh, lots of things you can say about that, but I'll just say this. Whatever was made wasn't coming from God. And that can all get shook. All religion, all that grows out of that. The thing that can't be shaken is our confidence in God, in the reality of God's presence in our life. Amen? So here's the question that I think Paul is actually asking. Have we come to a mountain that can't be touched? To a blazing fire? Amen? To darkness? You see, I said this, I think it was to Peter the other night we were talking at the prayer. Who we are as believers is determined by the nature of the God that we believe in. If you believe that he's hard, that he's mean, that he's strict, you're going to, your belief system will reproduce that. But if you know God, to be this God of love and of grace. There's a gracefulness that can flow from you. There's an acceptance, like Jane was saying here this morning, where no matter where the pe people are coming from, no matter how we think that they are and where they are and what they're doing, we can still love them. We can still reach out to them. We can still extend the love of God to them. We can believe that God wants to save that person even though we may have questions about whether he should or not. What if the revelation of God in Christ opens our eyes to see that what we thought was Mount Sinai was really Mount Zion all along? It was the people's interpretation or their thoughts of what that God was that kept them far back, that caused them to run from the darkness instead of embracing it the way Moses did. Not darkness, but light. Not religion, but the finished work of Jesus Christ. It looks dark, but believe me, in that darkness is birth all the light that has ever been. He looked on this, and it was dark and void, and he spoke grace. Jesus, the word, came forth. And where it had been dark is now light. God was in it. The spirit was moving on the face of that darkness. It was there all along. It just took somebody willing to go there to find it and to then reveal this light to the entire world, the light that's come into the world. Amen? Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. So I tell the grandkids, don't be afraid of the dark. Jesus is in there. Oh, there's a monster under my bed. Well, there's a bigger Jesus under there. Amen? The dark is just a way for God to expose himself and cause your faith to grow. Amen? So you can believe all things are possible.
whatsoever thou canst believe you can have. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day. Good week. Don't forget the meeting. Stick around for just a few minutes. Talk with uh, Jamie and Suzanne. If there's anything that uh, you can do to, to help out or to participate on any level, they'll be grateful. Amen. God will bless you. No, he will anyway, but it would be a good idea to just be nice. Praise the Lord.